Hey everyone, today's video is on shock and vasopressors and is another one in our SICU series. This is closely related to our previous video on postoperative hypotension, uh, but a bit more advanced. So I've long thought that maybe I should make a shorter video than my usual 15 to 20 minute diatribes. And this was a really tempting topic because if you only take one thing from this talk, I want it to be that if you have a surgical patient and you're giving them pressors, that the answer is norepinephrine. Almost always. Um, of course, it's me, and so the video is much longer, and there's much more information to follow. Uh, but if you take only one thing, I want this to be it. The rest of the talk is going to be about shock physiology and some exceptions to this rule. But again, this is a stressful situation. I want you to be able to just think norepinephrine, and then um, you can kind of start dealing with it and uh, start diagnosing the problem. So to start, um, why are we giving pressors in the first place? And that is generally to treat shock, which if someone asks you, the most common answer to what shock is, people will give is hypotension, uh, but that's actually incorrect. Um, the actual, the key feature of shock is inadequate cellular oxygen delivery and utilization to the end organs or the end tissues. And so while the hypotension is the circulatory failure that leads to this inadequate delivery, shock itself is all about tissues not getting oxygen no oxygen, the tissues can't function, and this leads to rapid death, first of the tissues and then of the whole organism. That is why this is such a stressful and important topic um, and time sensitive as well. So very important one to review if you're working in the ICU. So this is an excellent figure. Um, this is from a New England Journal article published back in 2013 that will be linked in the show notes. And I definitely re recommend checking out. It's free. It's also relatively short. Uh, but if you remember memorize a complex list of types of shock in medical school. Um, really, there's only four types that you need to have memorized and pretty much everything else falls somewhere within here. These four types listed from most common over here to least common over here are distributive shock, hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, and obstructive shock. So just briefly to run through these, distributive shock is a problem where the heart works fine. You've got an appropriate blood volume, but there's vasodilation, so the blood's now filling a bigger container, and you get low blood pressure because of that. This is most commonly caused by sepsis or septic shock, shock due to an infection. Hypovolemic shock, on the other hand, has a normal circulatory blood volume, um, a heart that's working well. Sorry, it has a normal container, essentially, the vascular system is not dilated. Uh, the heart's working well, but you've lost plasma or blood volume. So this can be caused by things like dehydration or bleeding. Cardiogenic shock is where the actual heart pump itself is failing to adequately pump blood forward through the system. This can be caused by things like uh, exacerbations of heart failure, um, acute myocardial infarctions, or arrhythmias. And then finally, obstructive shock, the most rare form of shock, is caused by an actual obstruction in the system that's preventing blood from moving forward the way it should. Uh, this is classically things like pericardial tamponade, pneumothorax, or uh, more distal obstruction, for example, by a pulmonary embolus. But the sad truth of the matter is that most shock is completely undifferentiated at presentation. So you're working in the ICU and you've got a patient that's crashing in front of you, crashing on the floor, and you have to do something to treat them. You don't have time really to completely diagnose the patient before you have to start treatment. So in that setting, what can you do? What should you do? First, it's important to think of what are even your options. So again, when we're thinking about shock, think back to those pictures we just went through. You're dealing with the heart, you're dealing with the vasculature, and you're dealing with the blood volume. You've only really got a couple buttons you can press or knobs you can turn uh, to treat these issues. Um, so with the heart, you can use medications like pressors. I mean, technically we should be saying inotropes or chronotropes, but I've used the more general term pressors to include these, or you can use electricity either to pace the heart that's not beating appropriately or to shock a heart out of an unstable rhythm. When it comes to vasculature, you can give pressors, again, medications. And when it comes to having an adequate blood volume, you can resuscitate with fluids or blood products. You can see that, especially where we're seeing pressors, these medications are never actually treating the underlying problem. They're just treating the symptoms. So while they're important, um, they're not the end all be all. And what I also really want you to think about is that the medication should almost be a bit of a last resort once you've ensured that somebody has an adequate 
circulating blood volume and is adequately resuscitated. And again, now that we know what buttons we have to press or what knobs we can turn in this stressful situation, it's also important to get kind of the background Bayesian probability of what is the most likely cause? What am I most likely treating here? Uh, what should I make sure my treatment algorithms absolutely do not miss? And actually, if we look at the data, this is from a, a nice New England Journal article from 2010, which was then made into this figure for the same article that we've quoted before. Uh, it's actually not an even split at all between these different types of shocks. Some are far more common than others, and as such, your treatment plan should take this into account. So if we look, the absolute most common shock is distributive, and not just distributive, but septic in particular. And that's a vast majority, so 62% is distributive septic shock. If we look at the number two causes, cardiogenic and hypovolemic, hypovolemic at 16%, cardiogenic also at 16%, and then we fall off rapidly. And so non-septic distributive shock is incredibly rare at only 4%, and obstructive is even half as rare as that again. Um, and so I'll see people again kind of hemming and hawing, what could this be? How should we treat it? What is the shock? And I tell them, you know, the majority of the time, this is going to be septic shock. So start treating with fluids, start treating with antibiotics, you know, make sure you're covering those bases. Don't go off in the corner thinking about, ooh, do I need that CTPE or not? Could this be a PE? Like, make sure you're covering the basics, and then once you... Once you've done that, you can start thinking about maybe the, the potential zebras that could be going on, but don't do that prematurely. So given these two facts, that you only have a few knobs you can turn and that um, medications like pressors don't actually treat the underlying problem and should be kind of a last resort. And two, knowing that the most common causes of shock, and a point I also want to make is that these are in all patients, not just surgical patients. You can imagine that surgical patients, it's going to be an even higher percentage of septic and hypovolemic shock as infections and bleeding are two of the most common complications of surgery, of any type of surgery. So knowing that, priority one for any surgical patient in shock needs to be resuscitation. You should assume your patient is either infected or bleeding or bloat or dry uh, until proven otherwise and make sure they are adequately resuscitated with fluids and or blood products. And only once that's done, should you be thinking about pressors. Obviously, if the patient's really unstable, you, you can be giving fluids and pressors at the same time, but the medications of pressors and inotropes will do nothing if the container, as it were, was empty of blood. Then once priority one is taken care of, if, presser, if you need a presser, Again, I want you to be thinking of norepinephrine. I've got, again, a picture of our shock states here and their relative frequency. So let's say your shock is the most common type, distributive shock. Well, norepinephrine is actually first line for this, so that's perfect. Let's say you're in hypovolemic shock. Uh, norepinephrine is also first line for this, so perfect. Of course, in hypovolemic shock, you should be really thinking about resuscitating the patient to get the adequate plasma or blood volume more so than treating this with pressors. Cardiogenic shock. Is it first line to give norepinephrine? No, not really. You know what it's not? It's not wrong to give norepinephrine in early cardiogenic shock. I know a ton of cardiologists and I repeatedly confirm this fact with them. If you're starting norepinephrine and they're in cardiogenic shock, that's okay. Um, and obstructive shock, again, incredibly rare, 2% of the time. If you're wrong about all these other things that you think and you start norepinephrine, that is still an okay presser to be using in obstructive shock. And really the key for obstructive shock is treating the underlying cause of that obstruction, not selecting an appropriate presser. So hopefully I've convinced you that in the undifferentiated patient, it's okay to just reach for norepinephrine and then uh, you can move on with the rest of your workup and diagnosis. All right, so a bit more on the science of pressors. So the science of pressors is really just the science of receptors. You're again thinking of what are those components of shock that I can actually deal, that I can actually manage as a physician. Um, that's the heart, the vasculature, and of course the blood volume. We talked about blood volume is managed via resuscitation with isotonic fluids or blood products. Um, but when we're talking about pressors, we're talking about medications that influence the vasculature and the heart. And there's, of course, a bunch of subtypes of this, and you can go pretty deep into the weeds, but we're just going to cover the very bare bones practical knowledge here. So 
what I want you to know is for the vasculature, you're thinking about alpha receptors and V1 receptors. And for the heart, you're thinking about beta receptors. So here's a nice table. It's from some sort of free online medical resource that I will also link in the show notes. I didn't watch it. I have no relation to them, but this table is pretty good. So the, the uh, talk probably is too, if you choose to look into it. So first, let's start with our favorite presser, the one we keep talking about, norepinephrine. We see that it has alpha effects. This is the effect on the peripheral vasculature causing vasoconstriction. We also see a beta effect. This has some inotropy effect on the heart. Uh, we see that it's used in septic shock, and it's most commonly used for most kinds of shock, and it's generally first line. So that's great. That's why we focused on it so much in this talk. The next presser I want to focus on is usually my next line presser, which is vasopressin. This acts on the V1 receptors. Remember, we mentioned that this works on the vasculature with vasoconstriction. This is really a nice adjunct to norepinephrine. As the doses of norepinephrine get higher, uh, vasopressin can prevent uh, the need from so much norepinephrine. It's almost a type of uh, hormonal resuscitation because in, when a patient's in a hypotensive state, um, they can rapidly go through their physiologic stores of vasopressin and need a bit of support there. Next presser I'm gonna talk about is epinephrine. This is kind of a dirty uh, medication. It hits a lot of different receptors. You see both alphas, both betas, has a lot of effect both on the vasculature and on the heart. Uh, the problem kind of with this, as opposed to norepinephrine, if it's, is it's very stressful on the heart, potentially more risk of arrhythmias, et cetera, uh, but still a very important presser. Some other pressers to focus on, uh, phenylephrine, this is kind of the classic answer for neurogenic shock or just an isolated uh, non-septic distributive shock just has alpha effect, which as we remember is related to basic constriction. Uh, anesthesiologists also usually use this quite a bit in the OR. One weird thing about phenylephrine is it often causes reflex bradycardia. And so in patients that are already bradycardic, it might not be the best choice. Moving on to those pressors that you will very rarely use as a surgery resident or trainee, uh, dobutamine. Um, this is the classic presser for cardiogenic shock. You see it has just beta effects. So this is, these are effects primarily uh, related to the heart. Uh, one thing to know is it does cause a mild peripheral vasodilation. So while in cardiogenic shock, it's good for getting the heart pumping better. It will actually dilate peripherally and can sometimes even drop the blood pressure paradoxically this way. All right, dopamine. This is basically like worse norepinephrine. You can see some similar receptors here in that we have both alpha and beta. It also affects dopamine receptors. So it does have some vasoconstriction as well as effects in the heart. Um, it's basically just second line to norepinephrine, uh, primarily related to the risks of tachyarrhythmias because of that extra effects on the heart that it has relative to norepinephrine. And finally, this presser is almost not even worth covering in this talk. Milrinone, it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. It's really... Uh, just has effects on the heart, especially the right heart, um, you used only in decompensated heart failure. And if you're using this presser, you'd better know more about the heart than I do. So I'm not going to give you advice on it. Uh, again, it can have issues with uh, hypotension, primarily related to vasodilation. All right. So back to more practical info. Um, how can you give pressers? So pressors are somewhat caustic medications, probably not great to get a bunch of those in your peripheral tissues. And so the general ideal is to give them through a central venous catheter or a central line. These of course typically go in the IJ, the subclavian or the femoral veins. However, as you can imagine, again, a crassing patient often will not have a central line and you should know that it's okay to give vasopressors through a good peripheral IV. Does it mean to be a good peripheral IV? Well, generally you want it to be relatively large, maybe an 18 or 20 gauge. Uh, you want it to be relatively proximal, so not very distal in the hand or in the antecubital fossa where it's highly risky to um, blow and extravasate. Uh, often you want this to be placed under ultrasound guidance. Um, but if you have a good peripheral IV, it is okay, at least for a short time, to give peripheral pressors, including norepinephrine through it. Um, just make sure you're noting that you're doing that and you should be planning to get central access as soon as safely possible. All right, so back to kind of practical basic skin, you often will need more than just one presser. So how would you step up your pressers in kind of an undifferentiated situation or a septic or distributed shock situation, which again is going to be 
most common, especially in our surgical patients. So I would recommend thinking first about norepinephrine, of course, as always. Vasopressin is a good second choice. This helps you keep you from needing as much norepinephrine. It's a good adjunct. A note about vasopressin is it's really just an off or on kind of binary medication. It's not one that's titrated like all the other pressors. So first, norepinephrine. Second, you can add on vaso. Third, epinephrine is probably your presser of choice. And then four, well, once you're thinking four pressors, this is a very dire clinical situation and you really want to, one, evaluate, do you have the right diagnosis? Are you treating the underlying cause adequately? And is this even a treatable problem? Is this something that can be fixed? Um, of course, you can always just throw on extra medications, but four pressors is a, a time where the patient is doing quite poorly and you're quite off the beaten press and beaten path, sorry, in terms of typical pressors. Um, and you're just trusting your kind of clinical judgment and your, the advice of your attendings, et cetera, at that point. Um, and you should also really be thinking as the pressors escalate, you should always be going back to, is my patient adequately resuscitated? Are they bleeding? You know, is there some reason why these pressors aren't working as they should? All right, some quick hits. Uh, this is good for test taking, things like the app site. So again, septic shock, first line presser, norepinephrine. Neurogenic shock, um, first line presser is on tests at least, I would probably still put phenylephrine. However, in real life, it's often actually norepinephrine uh, due to the bradycardia that often comes with neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock, of course, being common in something like a trauma patient that comes in with a spinal cord injury, they lose that uh, vascular tone to their periphery and they get that paradoxic picture where they're hypotensive and also bradycardic as opposed to most patients that would mount a tachycardic response to hypotension. So, of course, phenylephrine with it, with its reflex bradycardia can often make that bradycardia worse. And if that's the case, you would switch to norepinephrine instead. You can see again, norepinephrine is almost never the wrong answer. And then finally, if you have a test that is asking about cardiogenic shock, they're usually wanting you to answer the butamine. However, again, especially in those mixed stock mixed shock states you know you can imagine somebody who's septic and also they have a poorly functioning heart giving that dibutamine is going to give you that peripheral vasodilation you may need norepinephrine as well uh, to deal with that and that's it so to review um unknown shock think about norepinephrine and just always when you're dealing with this situation it's scary you don't know what to do always one think about resuscitating and two remember what your common causes of shock are distributive, hypovolemic, and then much lower, we're thinking cardiogenic and obstructive, and choose your pressors uh, with that in mind. Remembering that norepinephrine is first line here, first line here, and not wrong in either of these other situations. And that's it. These videos are for education purposes only. Do not use to diagnose or treat any diseases, and we will see you next time.